All right, hey there, Euro Bears. So let us begin our last and final unit on the post-war era that takes us from 1945 all the way up to present day by talking about the Cold War. Certainly the era of European history that dominates the post-war era. The Cold War, most of you have studied the Cold War from your United States history class and you know that after World War II, there were two superpowers that remained, and that was the United States of America, the leaders of the democratic, what we would call the free world or the first world, and the Soviet Union, the leaders of the communist world, which was ever expanding after World War II ended. And this was an era of ideological conflict that sometimes erupted into war, usually in what we call the developing or third world but it's interesting to think about in this era that lasts from 1945 until the end of the 1980s and, and then officially when the Soviet Union collapses on December the 25th, 1991. You know, did it have to be like this? The Soviet Union and the USA, despite their ideological differences, their political differences, we were allies against fascism, against Nazism. Could it have ended differently? Could the United States and the Soviet Union have gotten along. And that's kind of an interesting thought to consider as we understand the Cold War era. So let's take a look at what happened at the end of World War II, even before, or actually like towards the end of World War II, before World War II actually ends, to see kind of what happened to create this incredible animosity where you had these two very powerful countries trying to essentially influence the rest of the world and really looked at the other one as this hostile aggressor. How did it happen? Arguably, it starts in, the fe in February of 1945 with a meeting at Yalta, where you had Winston Churchill for his last full World War II conference meeting. He was only partially available at or, or there at, at Potsdam. An aging and frail Franklin D. Roosevelt, you can tell here from this picture a little bit that FDR is not well. And a victorious Stalin, who knows at February of 43 that the Red Army is now winning the war on the Eastern Front. Um, and, and the Soviet Union will ultimately be victorious. And so, you know, what are they discussing at this meeting? And hopefully you remember what they're discussing at this meeting. Eastern Europe. As the Red Army drives into Eastern Europe, pushing the Nazis back into Germany and taking over or liberating, however you want to think about it, the countries of Eastern Europe, like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, like what happens to those countries now that the Red Army is there? Remember, Churchill and FDR had made it this agreement at the Atlantic Charter, at the Atlantic Conference, uh, in August of 41, that this war is going to be fought for freedom. So now what's this mean? Now that this communist dictator's armies is, are, are, in the, are, in, are in the countries of Eastern Europe. So you've got FDR and Churchill here who both really believe, you know, we have to free these countries, provide them with a democracy. And Stalin, who really has other plans. Let's look at the map. So as Stalin's army goes into Eastern Europe, he really has different plans for Eastern Europe. Russians know that threats to their country come from Western Europe, be it Germany, be it France. These Western European countries are the ones that attack Russia. I guess if we want to go back even further than that, we could talk about Sweden and invading Russia uh, during the time of Peter the Great and after. So what Stalin wants to do is use these countries essentially as a buffer zone. He wants to have them under his control. Therefore, if Germany or France or England or the United States of America want to attack the Soviet Union, they got to go through these countries first. So they're going to be this buffer zone. Uh, we remember them now as the Eastern Bloc countries. The Warsaw Pact does not yet exist in 1944, 1940, or 1945 rather. But what do we do with these countries? So at Yalta, as you remember, FDR and Churchill agreed to, allow, agreed to uh, have Stalin keep his army there, and all of these countries are going to have the, a, a vote. They're going to they're have their, uh, 
ability to determine the government that they, they're going to be able to choose whatever government they want. And of course, this ends up being rigged, as FDR and Churchill suspected this would happen. All these countries are going to become communist countries. But in February of 45, I mean, really, what are they going to do? So now it's important as you look at this map that you look at the area that is in light blue, Yugoslavia. Remember that Yugoslavia had developed its own communist group that had successfully repelled the Nazis on their own at the end of the war, and they were led by Josip Broz Tito. Yugoslavia became a communist country under Tito's dictatorship. And it's important to know that Tito did a couple of things. He kept Yugoslavia separate from the domain of the USSR, and really what that means is Stalin's control. Yugoslavia will not join the Soviet Defensive Communist Alliance of the Warsaw Pact. They kind of remain separate and they do their own thing. Now, they are still a dictatorship, but they are separate from the Soviet Union. Stalin, of course, didn't like this and tried to kill Tito several times and he was unsuccessful in that attempt. But Tito keeps things together in the Soviet Union and they kind of do things their own way. Um, Tito, it's also very important to remember that this is Yugoslavia and there's all these multinational groups, Croatians, Bosnians, Serbs, all these groups. And he keeps all these groups uh, under control and really not fighting each other. Uh, communists don't believe in nationalism. Uh, they don't care about ethnicity. Everybody's equal. And Tito, you know, might have been a dictator, but he did keep these people uh, from fighting each other. Uh, for what it's worth, Tito himself was a Croatian. And if you look at this little picture here, in the 1980s, I remember Yugoslavia for creating a car that was a really cheap car called the Yugo. Uh, the Yugo was produced in Slovenia, the region of Slovenia, which was sort of the industrial area of Yugoslavia. So, there, so there's Tito. Uh, after Tito's death in the early 1980s, then uh, there will be sort of this rise of nationalism, especially when you have the collapse of communism in the late 1980s, and then all these national groups will want to form their own countries, and this leads to civil war, wars for independence, and then ultimately, very sadly, genocide. And this national, this, this, this national ethnic conflict continues today. Uh, the only reason why we don't read about genocide continuing to happen today is because the United States Army is there, stopping people from fighting. Hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about this later on when we talk about the 1990s. The last conference of World War II happens after the war ends in Europe. And a war ends in Europe on May the 8th, 1945. That is VE Day. And so what we have here is uh, this meeting that happens in the summer of 1945. We've got some different people in this group. Uh, obviously, Stalin, if you look at the right, is still there. And he's going to you know, represent Soviet interests, obviously. In the middle, we have the new American president, uh, Harry S. Truman, who becomes the president after the uh, death of FDR, who dies in office from a stroke. And on the left there is the new Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. His name is Clement Attlee. Britain went through an interesting transition during World War II. They actually socialized quite a bit. Uh, the interpretation that I have for this uh, that, I've, that, that I've just read about, it, which, which I find interesting, is uh, Britain started socializing uh, after the Blitz when people had to come together. The government had to work to help take care of people. And there was kind of a slow movement towards creating a more socialist government. So you have Clement Attlee, who is a member, who is a, the leader of the Labor Party. Winston Churchill did not like Clement Attlee. Obviously, uh, Clement Attlee took his job. Uh, Winston Churchill's description of Clement Attlee is, he is a sheep in sheep's clothing. But we've got a new liberal Labor Party government in, uh, in Britain. So they meet in Potsdam, and Potsdam is a suburb of Berlin. Uh, interestingly, if you go to Potsdam today, Potsdam is uh, the German equivalent of Hollywood. This is where they make a lot of films in Germany is in Potsdam. Uh, but it's a very interesting, uh, historically rich city uh, that's a suburb of Berlin. And so they, the big three here meet uh, to discuss what they're going to do with uh, Germany. And what they decide is that they are going to essentially create areas where the victorious allied powers are going to have regions where they control. 
with the ultimate goal of rebuilding and unifying Germany. So Potsdam lays the groundwork for a division of Germany that's going to split Germany into East Germany and West Germany, and also Berlin will be split into East and West Berlin. We'll learn about this a little bit later. But it's important to know in Potsdam, when they were meeting, they weren't discussing that. They were discussing how the Allied powers were going to kind of bring their armies in and rebuild different areas of Germany with the ultimate goal of unifying Germany. There was no long-term plan put in place in Potsdam to have Germany be split into East and West, which is, which is of course what happened. We'll come back to this. The United Nations, at the end of World War II, um, the United Nations is established. The United Nations is essentially the brainchild of uh, FDR. After the failure of the League of Nations, uh, he discussed uh, with uh, Winston Churchill the establishment of a new international organization where they really could stop war. Um, and this was going to. This is the United Nations. The United Nations, uh, in order for it to be a more effective tool in protecting peace, needs to have a Security Council and a peacekeeping force. So, in other words, the UN has essentially an army, a peacekeeping force. Uh, they believe that the best way to maintain the peace is for there to be the five. I guess what they identified as sort of the most powerful countries in the world that would have veto power over sending the peacekeeping force into any particular area. And the big five is the USA, Britain, France. In 1945, it was the USSR, but of course today it's Russia and China. And they have veto power in terms of sending in the military. This was a major step in creating hostilities between East and West. Winston Churchill was voted out of power in 1945. He was at, Winston Churchill was actually at the first part of the Potsdam Conference and said what he had to say, and then he, was, he had to leave because Clement Attlee showed up and took over. And so now that he's sort of retired from politics, at least temporarily, you know, what is he doing with his time? He was invited to the United States of America by President Harry S. Truman, who also invited him to his home state of Missouri. And uh, Winston Churchill gave a speech at Westminster College, a college that I know nothing about that's in Fulton, Missouri. I can only imagine it's a rather small school. But he gives the speech which becomes very famous and is remembered as the Iron Curtain speech. Winston Churchill is essentially describing the state of the world and what the world is like to these young people at Westminster College. And he famously begins this, or er, er, says in the speech, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across Europe. An iron curtain. He gives the Cold War its metaphor that an iron curtain, a metaphorical iron curtain, spl has split Europe between West and East, between democracy and the communist countries. And he goes on and in no uncertain terms describes how the countries in Eastern Europe, or in the cities of, of Eastern Europe, the great cities of like Dresden and Prague have, have been taken over by communism and totalitarianism. And these countries need to be freed. So this speech, which all he does is simply give us a way of understanding the world, does a lot to create hostilities. So it wasn't the Soviet Union. This might be important to remember, the, you know, the Soviet perspective. They didn't say an Iron Curtain had descended across Europe. It was Winston Churchill. Now, Winston Churchill, if we want to defend him, might have just been simply calling a spade a spade. You've got communism, you've got democracy. These two ideologies are incompatible with each other. The communists have taken over the East. The democracies have control of the West. Uh, this, is, this is the current state of the world. But with the Iron Curtain speech, it's adapted, and this, this metaphor is adapted by many people in terms of how they look at Europe, and that becomes very important. After World War II, communism became popular. It became popular in 
Uh, Western countries like France in 1945, 25% of France is going to be communist. And it also became popular here in Greece. So why is communism popular? We Americans sometimes have difficulty understanding this. Well, understand that communism is anti-fascism and communists became popular in the resistance movement against the fascist. And so the Nazis had taken over Greece and done a little bit of destruction in Greece. And so there was a communist movement that was simply anti-fascist. Same thing that happened in Yugoslavia, right? So after Greece is liberated in 1945, communists begin the process of taking over Greece. And there was a civil war that lasted for four years from 1945 to 1949. And the majority of the people in Greece were pro-communist. Now, here's where things become interesting in Greece yet again. We talked about the importance of Greece in European history in the early 19th century, in the 1820s, when there was the Philhellenic movement, uh, there was the uh, Greek war for independence against the Ottomans. Greece is special. And the reason why Greece is special is because we're taught in our history classes that Greece is where Western civilization began. You know, the Athenians with Athenian democracy way back in the 6th century BC, like this is the foundation of Western civilization, uh, the theater, the Olympics, philosophy, all that goes back to ancient Greece. And so there's a sense that, wow, if Greece falls to communism, what does that mean for the free world, democracy? Democracy was born in Greece. So there's a sense in the 1940s, similar to in the 1820s, that in, in Western Europe and now in the United States, that we must save Greece. We must save Greece. So the president of the United States steps up. He believes that we must support the non-communists in Greece. So Harry S. Truman begins providing money and military supplies to the non-communists. He does this first, and then a policy in the United States of America develops after this due to Truman's actions, and we call it the Truman Doctrine. And the idea is that the United States of America must now defend the free world. We will provide supplies and aid to any country that is non-communist from becoming communist. We're going to stop the spread of communism. So this becomes the Truman Doctrine, established 1947. But the Soviets, of course, have a different perspective on this. They're like, wait a minute, the majority of people in Greece are communist. There is a civil war going on in Greece. It is a civil war. Why is the United States meddling in Greece? We're not meddling in Greece. The Americans are. And so they look at the Americans as becoming capitalist imperialists. There's a great Soviet drawing of the United States. Here comes the Americans. Notice that there's a nice dollar sign on the machine gun. And they're chasing out the... Uh, the communist in Greece. In the end, does Greece become communist? No, Greece does not become communist. They have a democracy, even though it is a very uh, frail democracy, um, and they, they, there's going to be uh, a lot of problems throughout Greek history, a lot of political instability, and a lot of economic instability, which honestly persists to today. The next major event that happens at this uh, in, in the post-war era is the development of the Marshall Plan by the United States of America. The goal is, of course, to make sure that another world war doesn't happen and that Europe doesn't erupt into war again. So the Marshall Plan can most simply be seen as a contrast to the Treaty of Versailles of 1919, which of course uh, put war guilt and uh, war reparations, slapped war reparations onto Germany, who had to pay indemnities. And the Marshall Plan is the exact opposite of that. The idea was the United States of America was going to provide both Germany, Western Germany at least, and any European country that asked for it with a bunch of money to help rebuild the uh, rebuild Europe. So instead of demanding war reparations, we actually pour money into 
the countries. So it's the exact opposite. Um, the Americans can be sort of mocked for this, that we first, you know, bomb Germany to dust and then we pay for its reconstruction. That's one way to understand the Marshall Plan. But the Marshall Plan is, of course, a lot more complex than that. First of all, the Marshall Plan is named after George Marshall, uh, the American uh, general and the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during World War II. Uh, the Marshall, George Marshall himself wasn't the full architect of the plan. Uh, he was, his name was given to it because everybody liked George Marshall and the other architects were these kind of passionate anti-communists, uh, like, uh, Dean Ackeson, George Kennan, Will Clayton. These are the other, uh, politicians essentially who, in Washington, D.C., who are the architects as well of the Marshall Plan. But the Marshall Plan was a rather brilliant idea. Um, first of all, George Marshall, to give you more background on this, George Marshall went to Moscow and he met with the Soviet leadership. He wanted, he truly believed in a, a, an allied, joint allied development of Germany and to make sure that, you know, Germany developed and, and was a safe, good place and that, and that Germany was Germany and, and it's not divided. He, and he works on this, but he came back and dismayed and he really had a sense that the Soviets didn't didn't have any desire to rebuild Europe, Eastern Germany or Eastern Europe at all, but instead wanted to essentially do what we did with the Treaty of Versailles. They wanted to extract war reparations out of East Germany. They, the, the Soviets looked at Germany and thought, you started this war, you're going to pay for it. And that was their attitude. And they're going to you know strip Germany of resources and bring them back to the Soviet Union. And that was actually truly Stalin's plan. So George Marshall returns to the United States of America, and he and these other politicians say, okay, what are we going to do with Europe, and what are we going to do with Germany? And so they developed the idea of the Marshall Plan, and, and, and i, I got to express my own personal opinion here. It was really brilliant, and it was brilliant on a number of levels. So here was the Marshall Plan. Here's what the Marshall Plan was. The idea is to rebuild Europe in a way to create a permanent peace. So... The United States of America emerges out of World War II an economic powerhouse. The industrial machine of the United States of America really kicked into overdrive during World War II. I mean, we can make stuff, we can sell stuff. Our economy was super strong compared to any other economy in the world. And honestly, in our own country's history, really the strongest that it's ever been. It's absolutely amazing. So, um, I mean, it was a great time to be alive in the 1940s, 1950s. You had a job, there was money to be made, <laughs> it, the economy was booming, it was great. So, what are we going to do? We're going to take billions of American taxpayer dollars and we're going to ship it to Europe. But this is going to be done in a very organized way. We're not just going to throw money at Europe. How we did this was brilliant. So, with the Marshall Plan, what it entailed... A country that wants an aid, and we offer it to all countries, it doesn't matter where they are, they can be taken, or the Red Army could be there, it could be Poland. We offer a martial aid to everybody. So, but what a country must do is, is, is essentially make a shopping list. Like, here's what we want, here's what we want to spend money on, and place that request to the United States of America, and we buy the stuff and give it to the country. So that's part of it. So they actually had to make a list of here's what we're going to do with the money. Um, and here's the stuff that we want. Now, the other thing that we did with the Marshall Plan was look as is, is symbolized here in the middle propaganda po poster that you see on this slide. So you see all these slides, you see all these European flags flying together in a windmill, and it says, whatever the weather, we must move together. So part of us giving money to these countries is they had, to they had to cooperate economically with each other. They had to trade with each other. So the money, so in order to take the money, you had to specify what you were going to do with it, and you had to agree to cooperate economically with all the other countries. So we're breaking down economic barriers in between the countries. The countries must cooperate. They must work together. This is sort of a slight stepping stone towards the creation of the European Union much later on in European history. But we do this, and it works. Um, now, historians do like to debate to what extent did the Marshall Plan work? Could Europe have rebuilt, rebuilt itself without receiving billions of American taxpayer dollars? 
Um, and this is an issue of debate. I'm, I, I can't answer it. Uh, the one thing that historians agree upon, though, was it certainly was a, a morale booster for people in Europe. They loved receiving this money, and there was the sense that we are going to be saved. We're not going to crumble into an economic depression. So this was the Marshall Plan. And as you see, uh, we gave billions of dollars to countries in Western Europe. Uh, what about Eastern Europe? Uh, we were offering money to them too. We'll see what happens there later. Um, it's important to know that the United States, not all American politicians agreed with the Marshall Plan. There was another plan called the Morgenthau Plan in which we were plan which the plan was to keep Germany completely economically depressed. Um, so it would have been Treaty of Versailles all over again. Uh, and luckily, we didn't do this, so never mind the Morgenthau Plan. So the Marshall Plan. But so okay. So how did the Soviets see this? Well, here's how they see it. For this one quote from a Soviet uh, politician, he says the ruling gang of American imperialists have taken the path of open expansion of enslaving weakened capitalist countries. It has hatched new war plans against the Soviet Union imitating Hitler. The Americans are imitating Hitler. They're the new aggressors, but they are using blackmail. So this is how we're seen. We're essentially buying our friends. And honestly, maybe that's a fair statement. We are buying our friends, but we're also rebuilding Europe and providing democracy. So here's how the Americans see it. Uh, one critical uh, cartoon there on the left. There's the American taxpayers giving billions of dollars to the European countries, trying to get them to you know be self-sufficient. Um, here's a little bit more um, uh, political image that we see on the right. Uh, we have Europe, you know, crawling its way out of the abyss of communism. You see the uh, the the spires of Saint Basil's in Moscow and the Kremlin in the background. There, we're helping Europe uh, with the Marshall Plan to be able to pull itself out of. Uh, communism. Okay, so there's that, the Marshall Plan. What do the Germans do with some of the money? Well, it is absolutely amazing what happens to Germany after World War II. We bombed Germany to a pulp. We also did the same thing with Japan. And amazingly, two of the strongest economies that emerged in the 1960s and the 1970s are Germany and Japan. And even still today, Germany and Japan have very strong economies. How did they do this? Well, Here's this guy. Meet Conrad Adenauer. What's he do? He takes Marshall Plan money and he uses it to help rebuild Germany through rebuilding German industry. Conrad Adenauer does this and he also, as we'll learn later, really does a lot in reaching out to France and building up ties between France and Germany. And hey, isn't that nice? Throughout European history, the German-speaking world and the French-speaking world, they don't get along, right? So Conrad Adenauer will do a lot to heal those wounds and to help rebuild the German economy. Uh, German industry starts booming. There's a nice image of a, a Volkswagen bug and, uh, and a BMW. BMW's made... Uh, airplane uh, engines for the Luftwaffe, well, that's, they're not going to do that anymore after World War II, so they go on to making, you know, very nice German sedans. Germany had been destroyed in World War II, and Berlin in particular, <coughs> destroyed and divided what now is going to happen specifically to the capital of Berlin. What happens in Berlin is extraordinarily interesting and it helps to explain the culture of Germany today, what happens to Berlin from 1945 to 1950. The German government under Adenauer decides it wants to get people to move to Berlin. So they open the doors of Berlin. And who do they open the doors to? Turkish immigration, er, Turkish, uh, Turkish immigrants. They invite Turkish immigrants to come from Turkey into Berlin, Germany to rebuild Berlin. So they open the door. You get a five-year visa. You got to come and live in uh, Berlin. You get uh, a paid job to, in construction. You're going to rebuild the city of Berlin. So here are some arriving guest workers from Turkey.
looks like they're arriving in. And I guess this is <laughs> not the best image to show you for, for Berlin since they're getting out of the a train station at Hamburg, another northern German city that we also bombed to, bombed to a pulp. So uh, here's a great image of uh, some Turkish immigrants learning some basic German. Here's another image of Turkish immigrants arriving in Germany. And I think to myself, whenever I see this picture, wow, what would Hitler think of this? <laughs> These are not the type of uh, Germans that he imagined building Berlin. Here's just another image of uh, a German image uh, celebrating 52 years of guest workers who have come from Turkey to rebuild Berlin. Now, what's amazing is these guest workers that showed up to rebuild Berlin in 19, with their five-year visas, you know, after those five-year visas expire, they might go back home, but they don't. The overwhelming majority of Turkish guest workers who came to Berlin and to other cities in northern Germany like Hamburg, they stay. They built these cities. They're not going anywhere. Which is why if you go to Germany today, especially Berlin, there is a huge Sunni, Muslim, Turkish population that is in Berlin today. Berlin has just as many Turks living in it as Istanbul. It is a, a overwhelmingly a, a huge Turkish population in, in Berlin. And that explains uh, the diversity that you see in Berlin today. All right. So Stalin, let's go back to the to the eastern side. Let's go back to the communist side. You know, Stalin, you know, doesn't like the Marshall Plan, and he does, and he puts pressure on the Eastern European countries to to not accept any Marshall Plan aid. So no country in Eastern Europe will receive Marshall Plan aid unless you want to consider you know Greece to be uh, an Eastern European country, which sort of is. So Stalin wants to. Exp essentially explain to the Eastern European countries what the United States of America is doing. So common form is established and common form is an abbreviation for the Communist Information Bureau. And so common form is going to essentially be the party line in Eastern Europe for how to understand what the United States of America is doing. And they are going to agree, this is what the United States of America is doing. Here's what the Western European powers are doing. So common form explains. What is the Marshall Plan? The Marshall Plan is the United States of America buying its friends. This is what capitalists do. They prop up capitalist countries where they can make money. So investment bankers are going to come in and make investments into European countries that they are rebuilding, like in Western Germany and France and where else, and they are going to make money. And communism is, or I'm sorry, capitalism will develop in these areas. And what do you get with capitalism? You get a handful of rich and a whole bunch of exploited poor. So we must fight the, the American Marshall Plan system. So common form develops in this way. The Iron Curtain is felt in the Western Hemisphere and the democracies decide that the Soviet Union is an aggressive world power. Uh, a lot of this goes back to Yalta, the sense that the Soviet Union has expanded its influence into Eastern Europe and they are hostile towards the United States of America and to, and to the Western democratic countries. So the United States organizes NATO. NATO stands for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And what NATO is, is quite simply a defensive alliance. The agreement is among the Western European powers, which, and they call it the North Atlantic Treaty Organization because they say, it was said that, you know, the, the great democracies all developed on the rim of the Atlantic. And you think of the Netherlands, France, Britain, the United States. Uh, but of course, it'll expand beyond that. It'll include, you know, Italy, West Germany, you know, Benelux, etc. So, but... But the, the agreement with NATO is very simple. If the Soviet Union strikes one of us, they strike all of us. So we are a defensive alliance. Now, for what it's worth, the establishment of NATO in the late 1940s was a big change in foreign policy in the United States of America, going all the way back to George Washington. George Washington had uh, said in, in, his, uh, in his farewell address, 
for Americans of future generations to, quote, beware entangling alliances. So George Washington encouraged us never to engage in a peacetime alliance because, you know, if France gets involved in a war that we have nothing to do with, well, we're going to get involved now because we're there, NATO, we're NATO. So, um, so, but this was, you know, so this was kind of a break in American foreign policy. Um, the other thing that's important to know is NATO was established because of the Cold War, because of a threat for from the Soviet Union. So if we can fast forward to the 1990s, when the Soviet Union collapses, shouldn't NATO collapse? Um, and this becomes a sticking point for Russians today. Uh, if Vladimir Putin wants to talk about why he doesn't trust the United States of America today in the 21st century, he will say, he will mention at some point in time, NATO. You know, after the Cold War was over, why didn't the United States disband NATO? Instead, NATO expanded into Eastern Europe, and Russia felt that the Americans were continuing to be imperialist. So there's NATO. Okay, let's take it back all the way back to the uh, to the late 1940s, early 1950s. So from the Soviet perspective, uh, the United States of America has just created a gang. These are all of our friends. They're called NATO. Now, the United States says, well, we're a defensive alliance, but do we trust the United States of America? Maybe we need to have our own defensive alliance. So the Soviets create the Warsaw Pact. And the Warsaw Pact is, again, it's a defensive alliance against the NATO countries. So the idea is, if the United States of America attacks Poland or Czechoslovakia or Hungary, or if they dare to attack the Soviet Union, all of those countries will rush to their aid. So if you were, let's say, in let's say Poland, all right, and there actually was an attack on Poland, because you're like, well, we're Poland. <laughs> Not to be facetious here, but oh, we are always getting attacked. So if if the Americans actually try to take over Poland or do something like that, thank goodness, Big Brother, the Soviet Union, they've got our back. The, the full military might of the Red Army will come and save us from the United States of America. This was the point of the Warsaw Pact. Again, I want to accentuate that this was a defensive alliance. So this isn't the United this isn't the Soviet Union controlling these countries. And just like with NATO, it shouldn't be the United States controlling France or Britain or whatever. This was to be a defensive alliance. Should be a defensive alliance. So, but will it remain a defensive alliance? We'll see what happens with both NATO and the Warsaw Pact as we get further into the Cold War. All right. Berlin. Berlin becomes sort of ground zero for the entirety of the Cold War, and really the entirety of the Cold War, from 19, from the Potsdam Conference all the way through the, to the end of communism and the fall of the Berlin Wall. So, you know, what makes Berlin interesting? So, okay, so let's look at this map that you see here. So here you see all the particular zones of Germany as they were divided up by Potsdam. So you've got, uh, you know, on top, you know, the, well, you look at the western part of Germany, you've got the British sector, the French sector, the France, France got a little bit of area to control with western Germany, and the Americans in the south. Um, and then the Soviets control the eastern part of Germany. Now, eventually what this does is it leads to a split in Germany. And from the late 1940s through 1990, Germany is divided into western Germany and Eastern Germany. The West is the Federal Republic of Germany, that's the Democratic side, and uh, the other side, the Eastern side, is the Deutsche Democratic Republic. Uh, I guess that would be the, uh, the, 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 the People's Republic of Germany. Um, so there's that, so Germany is divided. But what's interesting is the capital of Berlin, Potsdam had had each of the Allied powers occupy Berlin, and Berlin was divided into zones or sectors as well. Um, so let me go to this slide right here. So, you know, Berlin was divided as well. And, uh, and there's some nice quotes there. But, you know, Berlin is on the east side. It's in the eastern sector of Germany. It's in East Germany. And, uh, and, and, and in the eastern side of Germany is, you know, the Western powers, France, Britain, and the United States. And they're controlling portions of Berlin. So from the Soviet perspective, by the time we get to the late 1940s, this is not fair. If we have an Iron Curtain and Europe is divided, 
there should not be this island of democratic Western powers on the eastern side of the Berlin Wall. So Stalin, the Soviet leader uh, up until 1953, says Berlin is a bone in our throat. Now we want to cough it out. We want to get rid of it. And by Berlin, he means the, the western part of Berlin. Um, the uh, following leader of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, has a far more colorful way of describing uh, Berlin. He says, Berlin is the testicles of the West. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and that's how they saw West Berlin. Like, this is a daring thing for the Western powers to do. This is our side of the Iron Curtain. Give it back. So let me go back to this slide now. Very famously, in 1948, Stalin essentially quarantines or places under siege the western part of Berlin. Uh, he doesn't allow any traffic going out of West Berlin, thus depriving the West Berliners of any aid or any material, food, resources, etc. So the idea is Stalin is going to starve out the people of West Berlin, get them to essentially beg Stalin and the Red Army to go in and liberate them. That's, that's his goal. So the American response then, and here's where America first has to deal with this, and it will not be the last. What do we do with Berlin? Do we just let Berlin fall and let the communists take it over? So the Truman administration decides, no, we cannot let Berlin fall. This was Stalin pounding his chest. You know, America, United States, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? Are you going to invade us? Are you going to come and try to take West Berlin? What are you going to do? And the Americans' response was to provide supplies. For nearly a year, we fly bombers into West Berlin filled with food and supplies and also famously a lot of candy bars and cigarettes. <laughs> and the candy bars, not the cigarettes, but the candy bars go to the kids and everybody loves the Americans because we are the lifeline for West Berlin. This lasts um, for almost a year, uh, until it goes into 1949, and then uh, Stalin once again allows for traffic to go in and out of West Berlin. All right, Berlin. In the early 1950s then, a few years after, uh, uh, the, after uh, Stalin uh, uh, quarantines Ber West Berlin and we've got the Berlin airlift, Something interesting happens, not in West Berlin, but in East Berlin. So German, East, Germany, Eastern Germany uh, was going through a very rough time because of how Stalin looked at the Germans. He's like, you guys, uh, you started World War II, so I'm going to extract stuff from, from, from Germany. And we're going to take resources from Germany and it's going to go to the people of the Soviet Union who won uh, World War II. And so in Berlin, what you have is a, in East Berlin and in East Germany, you've got a communist government. And what was happening in East Berlin was the cost of goods, which is, of course, dictated by the East German communist government, begins going up and workers' pay remains stable. So it became increasingly hard for workers in East Berlin to uh, be able to feed their families. So what do they do? They protest, they go on strike, they want to have a, they want to have labor unions in which they can do collective bargaining for their money and for their pay. The Soviet response to this, are they just going to let the East Berliners do what they want to do after all? This is East Berlin, this is not the Soviet Union. This is East Germany. This is not the Soviet Union. Should the Soviet Union get involved? And the Soviet Union did get involved. They went in to East Berlin to put down the strikes. Soviet soldiers were told to fire upon East German workers who were on strike and who refused to essentially go back to work. Um, and this happened. And the Berlin Uprising of 1953 was crushed by force by the Soviet Union. If you go to Berlin today, you go to the Brandenburg, to Brandenburg Gate today, there's actually a memorial for this. But the memorial is, interestingly, at least the one that I saw, for Russian soldiers who refused to fire upon the Berliners. 
So, but this was a, a big event. The Soviet Union is, you know, flexing its muscles and showing its might. Uh, it's also important to know that in the post-war era, uh, some important events happen internationally. Uh, in response to the Holocaust, the United Nations helps to establish the country of Israel in the region of Palestine. Um, and this is the ultimate kind of fulfillment of Theodore Herzl's book, The Jewish State. And there you have the first leader of Israel, David Ben-Gurion. Um, in Egypt, interesting things happen as well. Uh, the, the, the Suez Canal, which was controlled by the British, was taken over and nationalized by a, uh, by a, a pan-Arabic movement. Uh, and Nasser, the leader of Egypt, uh, tries to nationalize the Suez Canal. Uh, so when this happens, the British begin fighting the Egyptians uh, and taking over the canal. And uh, the British hoped that the United States of America would jump in and help them. We're all part of NATO. And so they kind of hoped that the, the Americans would, you know, help out the British interest. And the, and the, so the President of the United States at the time was Dwight David Eisenhower. Let's look at this picture. Here's the uh, British Prime Minister. His name is uh, Prime Minister Eden. Uh, he was a conservative. Uh, president Eisenhower, a, a Republican president for the United States at the time, uh, Eden had hoped that Eisenhower would help out the British, and Eisenhower has to make a decision. Do we send in American troops to help the British uh, maintain control of the Suez Canal? And the Americans decide not to do so. Uh, the idea is the British, you don't make moves uh, expecting the United States just to come to your aid and help you. We're, you know, you consult with us first. So, uh, the creation of Israel and the Suez Crisis of 56, uh, these are two events that happen uh, that, that, that are major events, but they sort of kind of happen in the periphery of uh, European history. All right, and this brings us to France. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the very interesting and unique role that France plays in the latter half of 20th century European history. Maybe France always plays a very unique role in European history. They sort of are a driving force in uh, European history, and they kind of do things uh, their own way in the second half of the 20th century. So let's talk about France, and really the story of France in the second half of the 20th century is the story of Charles de Gaulle. Who was Charles de Gaulle? He was a World War I veteran. In World War II, he was a tank commander. But before the Nazis were able to take over France, he got away. Where does he go to? He goes to England, where for the remainder of, well, France being occupied by the Nazis, he was the self-proclaimed leader of the Free French. What made him the leader of the Free French? He said he was the leader of the Free French. He gave radio broadcasts across the English Channel into France, encouraging the French people to rise up and, and join the French resistance and to fight the Nazis. He sort of summoned the spirit of Joan of Arc from uh, the Hundred Years' War when Joan of Arc rose up against the English masters at that time. <laughs> Charles de Gaulle is encouraging the French people to rise up against their Nazi masters in the 20th century. So he encourages uh, the, the French resistance. And so in 1944, on June the 6th, when D-Day finally happens, and France is really liberated, mostly by the United States and Great Britain, they drive into France, but when they get to Paris... By August of 44, it's Charles de Gaulle who gets to lead an entourage of, well, people who believe in democracy and freedom into Paris as the Nazis lead, uh, as the Nazis leave. Uh, Charles de Gaulle is a very tall individual, as you see here, and there were some Nazis that kind of hung around to try to shoot from windows to kill Charles de Gaulle, but none were successful. And Charles de Gaulle becomes the leader of France. So after the United States and Great Britain liberate France, who are we going to kind of sort of help set up to be in charge? Well, Charles de Gaulle is our guy. So Charles de Gaulle, we don't have a, a, a new official government yet. Uh, that doesn't happen until 1946. 
So, you know, in the long history of French republics, you know, we've got our first republic set up in 1789, and then we have the second republic set up briefly from, from 1848 to 1852, and then we have the long third republic, which happens after the Franco-Prussian War beginning in 1871, and that lasts all the way to the Nazi invasion of 1940. And then we have the Vichy uh, government of, of Nazi-controlled France. And, uh, and then after the liberation of uh, D-Day and, and, and the liberation of Paris, we've got a provisional government, which, which is set up and it lasts from 1944 to 1946, as you see here. And then the Fourth Republic will be established in 1946. So Charles de Gaulle comes along and he really has the momentous a task of rebuilding France after the Nazis leave. So what does he do? Well, he in part has to oversee the trials of the of the of the Nazi collaborators in France. You know, trying to decide, well, who is deserving of prison, who is deserving of execution. Um, you know, when the Nazis showed up, if you were just an ordinary French citizen, you know, you're sort of probably going to collaborate because, you know, you want to keep your job, you want to be able to survive, like, so you got to collaborate with the Nazis. But to what degree do you collaborate with the Nazis? If you know people who are Jewish, you know, do you turn them in or do you try to hide them or do you try to remain silent? Like, to what degree do you collaborate with the Nazis? So, you know, anybody who was part of the resistance is obviously a celebrated hero at this point. And, you know, maybe a lot of people will start exaggerating their role in the French resistance. So it's sort of a tense social cultural time in France from 1944 to 1946. But de Gaulle does help oversee the trials of the, of the Nazi collaborators during the Vichy era of France. And then Charles de Gaulle is, has no love of communist. And communism in France develops... Uh, quite significantly in the post-war period, the immediate post-war period, in 1946, 25% of all French people are communist. But then as uh, the Fourth uh, French Republic is being established and they are writing a constitution for the Fourth Republic, Charles de Gaulle is sickened by it. He just he, he thinks it's an absolutely terrible form of government. He hates the constitution of the Fourth Republic. And the reason why he hates the constitution is because as the French set up their national assembly, the major legislative body of France, they provide the, the national assembly with the most power. And they've got a very, very weak executive branch. So Charles de Gaulle looks at this and he's like, if, the, if we have a parliamentary government like you're setting it up, and there's this wide variety of political parties in France, and you've got 25 percent of France, which is communist. This is going to be a mess. You're not going to be able to accomplish anything. Uh, the economy is going to flounder. It's it's not going to be a strong government. So Charles de Gaulle decides he wants nothing to do with with, with politics, and in 1946 simply quits. He simply quits, and he moves to the beautiful. Uh, French countryside where he has a very large estate and he just hangs out there. Uh, he's out of he's out of politics and he's out of government and he just sort of is in retirement. But de Gaulle knew what he was doing in 1946 because he truly believed that the French Fourth Republic was very weak and it would collapse. And he predicted when it collapses, people will come crawling to me and they'll ask me to save France once again. And he was right. Uh, the French Fourth Republic will collapse, but he uh, didn't realize how long he was going to wait. It's going to be 12 years before the French Fourth Republic is going to collapse. So the French Fourth Republic, here's a cool image of the Arc de Triomphe in downtown Paris. Um, the French Fourth Republic uh, was established in 1946, and we see how long it lasts. Uh, and uh, it's important to know that France is a rather left-leaning communist country. It's at least going in that direction, and, and that's kind of interesting for a, a country that is a part of NATO. Uh, and so and it has this weak executive branch. The, the National Assembly is in charge. But the first president of the French Fourth Republic ended up being a really good guy who really helped France out significantly, in large part because he cooperated so much with other, uh, uh, other countries. Uh, specifically, the United States, uh, he acquired a lot of money from the Marshall Plan, and he also worked cooperatively with Conrad Adenauer and West Germany. And this individual that we see here, his name is Jean Monnet. So Jean Monnet did a great job of reestablishing France economically and politically international, but internationally. So, so what he did was pretty momentous, and we get a sense of how much France is changing. 
uh, after two major wars with Germany, and man, if there's anybody who hates the Germans, it's the French. I mean, going all the way back to, you know, the Valois-Habsburg conflicts. Um, and, and Jean Monnet reaches out to Conrad Na Adenauer, and Conrad Adenauer and Jean Monnet really build this bridge between Germany and France that exists largely still today, except when the two countries play soccer. <laughs> Germany and, and, and France, they get along pretty well, and, they're, and they're, they're trading partners, and they're economically codependent, and they're friends. They're, very, they're on very friendly terms. And this is largely the work that was put into place between Jean Monnet and Conrad Adenauer. So, and uh, Jean Monnet also, you know, just to repeat, you know, thanks to the Marshall Plan, he helps rebuild the, rebuild the economy of France. So France is doing okay in the 1950s. It's, it's making its comeback, thanks to Jean Monnet. Now, here is where France starts to struggle in the post-war period. The post-war period is also a period of decolonization. So if you remember in the late 19th century, there was the period of colonization where European countries essentially start taking over the entire world. And because of the economic fallouts and sort of some cultural changes that happen in Europe after World War II, there's a period of decolonization in which a lot of colonies start breaking off and going free. So now is when I talk about a little country called Vietnam. Vietnam had been a French colony since the middle of the 19th century. And you see this on the image on the right, that the French had taken over areas that it identified as Indochina over a period of time throughout the 19th century. And it established colonial rule there. But when World War II came along, the Nazis invade France, and so the French can't really control their colonies anymore because they're not France anymore. Germany rules them. And so at this particular point in time, the countries of French Indochina begin breaking off and going free, but not for very long because the Germans had an alliance with Japan. And pretty much after Germany took over France, here comes Japan to take over Indochina. And when the Japanese took over Indochina, some of these countries in Indochina, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, start making an attempt to break off and go free from the Japanese. They begin fighting the Japanese during World War II. So one of the uh, military leaders of Vietnam was a man named General Giap, and he fought the Japanese, and he fought them guerrilla warfare style. So when World War II, when World War II ends, the people of Vietnam are breaking off and they're going free from the Japanese. You know who supported the people of Vietnam at this moment? The United States of America, because we also were fighting the Japanese. And for a brief moment of time, in the fall of 1945, you had the uh, American military commanders, and specifically sort of our uh, intelligence guys, kind of the pre-CIA, uh, they were in Vietnam working with this General Giap, and a political leader of Vietnam, a man by the name of Ho Chi Minh. And Ho Chi Minh had drafted a Declaration of Independence for the people of Vietnam in which he openly plagiarized the American Declaration of Independence and the Declaration of Rights of Man uh, from the French uh, cultural tradition. And so Vietnam's going free in 1945. Oh no, but here comes France again. And France says, well, we need to rebuild our economy, which means we need to have our old colonies back, including Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, Indochina, because there's a lot of rubber there, and, and, and the Michelin tire company in France wanted this rubber. So here comes France again. So America has to decide, our country has to decide, well, do we support the Vietnamese independence movement because we had been supporting that? Or do we support our allies, the French? And we made the decision to support the allies, our allies, the French, which will prove to be very costly for our country in the end. So here come the French, but the Vietnamese don't want the French there anymore. So this guerrilla warfare group begins calling itself the Viet Minh, and they start fighting the French, doing this hit and run guerrilla warfare tactics as the French reestablish colonial control. Well, the French are like, we're not going to take this. So they built a huge fort in the northern part of Vietnam, right along the border of Laos, called Dien Bien Phu, this huge super fortress with all this modern military equipment. They're like, there's no way that these rice paddy farmers 
with you know who who fight guerrilla warfare style can ever attack this major fortress. But guess what? Those rice paddy farmers who used guerrilla warfare tactics did successfully surround and bombard the French fortress of Dien Bien Phu. And in 1954, completely surrounded, the French surrendered and they gave up their colony. And the French leave in 1954. So you think, well, okay, the Vietnamese have, have decolonized from, and they're broken, they've broken free from France. They're free. But no, the, at this point in time, the, the, the Vietnamese proclaimed themselves to be communist, and the United States of America was really concerned with the spread of communism by 1954. Up north, China had become communist in 1949. They had been supplying materials to the Viet Minh. They're like, no, the Americans start talking about something called the domino effect, uh, that if, when one country follows the communism, all the neighboring countries follow the communism, so we have to stop at some place, and we start sending in our military to stop the spread of communism in Vietnam. And you probably know the story of what happens there. We lose that war, uh, and it continues on until, well, 1973, and then all of Vietnam becomes communist in 1975. So back to France. You know, France let this go in 1954. But when France lets this go, then all these other African colonies of France, and France has got a, has a lot of colonies in Africa, they looked at what the Vietnamese did, and they're like, wow, hit and run, guerrilla warfare style works against the French. So guess what they all start doing? And one by one, a lot of these countries start breaking off and going free. Uh, the year 1960 was called the year of Africa in France because all these countries were breaking off and going free. But of all their colonies, there was one that the French never wanted to let go of. And I've been building this up for quite some time throughout the course of AP European history. Algeria. The French had been proclaiming since the reign of Charles X in the 1820s that Algeria is France. But the F Algerians... Some of them, certainly not all of them, feel that way. Partly inspired by some of the Pan-Arabic movements led by like Nasser in Egypt. And uh, partly inspired by the fact that they know that France is vulnerable to these, uh, this guerrilla warfare. Uh, that uh, the, some Algerians decide, well, now's our time to strike. The Algerian War for Independence will last from 1956 to 1962. And it starts with a very, very small group of Arab militia fighters. And they call themselves the FLN, uh, which we translate into English as the National Liberation Front. These were pro-Arabic, anti-French, Algerian nationalists. And, you know, following the model of the Vietnamese, they do hit-and-run guerrilla warfare. And they don't really target military targets. They target civilians. So they'll go into like Algiers or Oran and they'll find a cafe where there's a bunch of Pied Noir, throw a few grenades, kill civilians, and flee. Terrible, awful terrorist activities. So the French military is going to respond. The government, National Assembly, is like, all right, Fran the, the military is going in. Find these FLN. Go and kill them. But who are the FLN? Well, the French military are mostly, well, to put it bluntly, white guys from France. They're going into Algeria, and they know that the FLN is an Arabic organization, so they go into communities of Arabs and they're trying to find, you know, who the FLN are. And then probably a little ethnic discrimination starts happening. They just start killing Arabs. Now, what's this do? Well, now you've got French soldiers killing some civilians. And so this kind of, if, if you're a, a native Algerian, if you're an Arab, you're like, well... Clearly, the French, our French government is not on our side anymore, and more and more of the Arabs in Algeria begin going to the FLN and supporting the FLN and hiding the FLN. 
And so the FLN grows in size and then becomes more violent. And they start doing, you know, awful things, doing this hit-and-run guerrilla warfare against sometimes civilians in the streets of Iran and Algiers and elsewhere. And so it starts getting extraordinarily violent. And also one of the uh, sort of as big aspects of the Algerian war for independence is the use of torture. And both sides use torture. Uh, but, you know, if you think, if you're part of the French military, you know, you want to find out, well, who are the real FLN versus just an Arab civilian? Like, how, how do we figure out who these people are? Well, you got to get people to talk. You got to find out. But a lot of these people are hiding the FLN. So in order to get them to talk, you resort to torture. And there was a lot of torture that was used on both sides. A lot of the French soldiers who were captured by the FLN were then tortured severe, severely. So this is all going on in Algeria. What's going on in Paris? So the National Assembly. Here they are in Paris. You know, well, this is a modern picture of the National Assembly today. But, you know, back in the, in the 50s, they're like, well, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Well, at this point in time in France's history, they're largely, they're, they're no, there's not a lot of imperialist fervor anymore. There's, it, 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 France is a very liberal country at this point in time. And there's a lot of communists, and communists tend to be very anti-imperialist. Um, and so the, the overwhelming sentiment is, let Algeria go. But there's not enough of them to make a, a decision. The superheroes of France's culture at this point in time aren't athletes or film stars, although there are a few famous film stars, but rather the intellectuals of Paris. And, and, and what they have to say carries a lot of weight and influences a lot of people. Uh, I don't think any country idolizes its philosophers like France does. So here's a picture of sort of a 20th century salon in uh, Paris. And there are some people in this image that you should know. If you look in the dead middle of the image, uh, the individual with his arms folded there, that's Pablo Picasso. To Pablo Picasso's left and to our right is the tall and elegant Simone de Beauvoir. Down in the middle part of the, uh, of the picture, playing with the dog, uh, that is Albert Camus. And to Albert Camus' right and to our bottom left, sitting slightly cross-legged on the floor with a pipe and a wandering right eye, that is Jean-Paul Sartre, the founder of the existentialist school of thought. So what do these people have to say about Algeria? Their words carry a lot of weight, especially since Jean-Paul Sartre and uh, Albert Camus both are newspaper editors. Well, Sartre and de Beauvoir, communists, are clearly on the side of the Algerian independence movement. Uh, France should no longer be an imperialist power. They should let go of all their colonies. These two advocate for this loudly. But what about this guy, Albert Camus? What makes Camus very unique is that he is not French. He is Algerian. Here's a fantastic photograph of Albert Camus' family when he was growing up in the early 20th century. Albert Camus is the young boy in the dark clothes in the dead middle of this painting. That is him. Looks like he's got a family member. I don't know if that's a big brother or whoever, you know, with his arm draped around his shoulder in sort of a protective uh, way. But that's Albert Camus' family, and you get a sense of a poor Pied Noir family. Albert Camus never knew his dad. His dad died in the First World War before Camus was able to talk. Uh, and he never, uh, and his mom, speaking of talking, his mom was a mute. His mom never spoke. Uh, Camus was very close to both his mom and his grandma. But that's Camus' family. So Camus, how did he feel about the Algerian War for Independence? Camus, this man who doesn't believe in ideologies or subscribing to any one single belief system because he believes that dehumanizes you. What does he believe? Well, he's absolutely quiet on the issue. He doesn't talk about it at all. The press asks him questions. He simply doesn't respond. He is dead silent on the Algerian War for Independence. Until, in the late 1950s, he is awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, mostly for his work in his book, The Rebel. And when he is in Stockholm, Sweden, accepting the Nobel Peace Prize, he is accosted by Algerian nationalists who, in a public space, are able to corner him and say, we're Algerian. 
You're Algerian. You're the most famous Algerian in the world right now, Albert Camus. What do you have to say about this war for independence? What do you have to say? And Albert Camus comes out and says this. You guys are committing acts of terrorism. You are throwing bombs onto trains in which there are pied noir simply going to work. Understand that my mom could be on that train where you're throwing bombs, and I'm concerned about her. He says, you believe in justice, and I believe in justice too, but I believe in my mom more. He was asked, later asked for clarification, and he stated publicly, and we got it down, this. I have always denounced terrorism. I must, I must also denounce a terrorism which is exercised blindly in the streets of Algiers, for example, and which someday could strike my mother or my family. I believe in justice, but I shall defend my mother above justice. Kind of an interesting uh, take on the, on the war for, for Algerian independence. All right, but what's going on? Let's go back to what the French are actually doing. So as the National Assembly begins to lean more and more towards uh, maybe freeing uh, Algeria, the French military says enough, and generals in the French military begin to plan a coup. Now let's remember what the French military has gone through. They've lost a lot of guys. They've lost a lot of guys, first in Indochina, then in other places in Africa, and then fighting the FLN. Now, are we just going to let Algeria go, and all these French men will have died in vain? There's not. We're not going to do this. We're keeping Algeria. So, as the as 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 the for, French Fourth Republic and the National Assembly begins to waffle, these guys plan to take over the government. So, what do they do? <laughs> they first took over Corsica. And they, they begin ruling Corsica. What a great, historically ironic place to begin. Corsica, the homeland of Napoleon. The French military generals start there. and They take over Corsica. And from Corsica, they plan to launch an invasion of Paris and take over the government. And we're going to have a military dictatorship of France. The National Assembly goes, oh, crap. What are we going to do now? We need somebody to save France. The French military is divided and the generals may invade Paris and take us over and they're going to run the show as a military dictatorship. What we need is somebody to save France. What we need is somebody so revered that even the French generals will respect this individual. And so you know who they call upon. He is summoned from his beautiful country estate. De Gaulle, we need you. De Gaulle, we need you. Come to Paris. And come to Paris he does. When he comes to Paris, the year is 1958. It's May of 1958. And Charles de Gaulle says, If I come to save Paris and to save France, I want to get rid of the French Fourth Republic, and I want six months of extraordinary emergency powers. I want to rule for six months. Now, he was not technically a dictator, but in effect, he was. Charles de Gaulle got to be a dictator or an autocrat of France, even though those weren't terms that were actually used. He got to rule France as one man for six months. Newspapers interviewed him and they said, you know, six months with these extraordinary emergency uh, powers, you know, aren't you going to become a dictator? Because how many times in history is an individual given this much power and then steps down? You know, <laughs> maybe George Washington. That's it. Like, how many times does somebody do this? Charles de Gaulle's response to this, like, am I going to become a dictator, was this. this. And this is what he told the press. He said, I'm in my 70s. I've been through two world wars. I'm too old and too tired to be a dictator. I am not going to be a dictator. But we do need to clean up France. We do need to, we, we, we do need to create a new government. And, and I need to run the show for six months. And then we're going to create a fifth republic. And the Fifth Republic will have a strong executive branch. And so it goes. And in taking over France, 
and establishing the, the Fifth Republic, he then has to deal with Algeria and the Algerian crisis. So what de Gaulle does is he goes and he meets with the leaders of all sides. He meets with the FLN. He meets with the generals. The generals are quite certain that he, de Gaulle, will never let uh, uh, the Algeria go. And this is the reason why the, 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 the generals called off an invasion of Paris to take over France. But when de Gaulle sits down and he meets with all these sides, the FLN, Pete Noir, the generals, various factions, he doesn't really talk much in this meeting. He just simply asks them to talk, to clarify their perspective, to explain what they want and why it's reasonable that they should get what they want. So he's simply a good listener. And at the end of all the conversations, he says the same thing, which is, as you see here, je vous ai compris, I have heard you, and then walks out. And he doesn't make any decisions until he does. And he finally makes the, Alge uh, the decision on Algeria in the year 1962. And in 1962, he proclaims Algeria is free. He just simply says it. Algeria goes free. The generals didn't believe it. In fact, there was a secret organization uh, that the generals supported to assassinate Charles de Gaulle because of this decision, uh, but none of those assassina assassination attempts uh, were successful. But Algeria goes free. And we enter into the period of the French Fifth Republic. This is the last Republic of France that brings us to modern day. Charles de Gaulle wanted to lead France into a new era, and he wants France to play a unique role in the Cold War. Because when we think of the Cold War, we think about the world dominated by the two superpowers of the USSR and the USA. But France wants to have a say in this. And Charles de Gaulle realizes that France has this unique position both geographically in between USSR and USA and culturally and politically. Uh, there's quite a few communists in, the, in France. Uh, there's a lot of conservatives also in France. Uh, and France might play this unique role in the Cold War world. So here's what Charles de Gaulle does. He says, France will not play sides. France will be its own great country, completely separate from the Cold War. So France is a part of NATO, but when de Gaulle shows up, he says, France is out of NATO. We're no longer part of NATO. And he begins making tours into the communist world. He sees France as a country that might be able to diffuse the tensions of the Cold War. And this is happening around the exact same time as the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example. And France could play this sort of unique sort of role. And there would be two superpowers, but three. And France would be this force for peace. But this doesn't bode well for U.S.-French relations. The United States and France, we've always been competitive with each other. I think this is because our, 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 our histories are so tied with each other. We've liberated France twice, we, but at the same time, we would have never won our revolution if it wasn't for the help of the French. We never would have acquired the Louisiana Territory if it wasn't for the French. The French has, have helped us out immensely. But there's also been this massive competition between our two countries throughout the course of our history. And so, but de Gaulle's saying all the French, all the United States troops have to leave France forever. <laughs> Uh, he, he, this, this, so he gets a lot of support. There's a lot of French nationalism in this. So the Americans did have military bases in France after World War II. We had liberated France in World War II, and now all these military bases are going to be closed and, and claimed by the French. And the French are like, yay, go France and get out USA. Uh, probably the best uh, response out of the United States of America at this time came from our Secretary of State. Uh, this was all happening during the Kennedy administration in the early 1960s. Uh, the uh, Secretary of State was appointed by John F. Kennedy, and his name was Dean Rusk, and his response to de Gaulle was this. Hey, President de Gaulle, does your order include the bodies of some 20,000 American soldiers that lie in France's cemeteries? So, reminding Charles de Gaulle that France would not be free without the United States of America. 
Uh, De Gaulle, to my knowledge, did not respond to this particular comment, but it is a pretty good zinger. As we talk about American and French relations during the era of De Gaulle, it's worth noting that our First Lady at the time went to college at the University of Paris, the Sorbonne, and she herself was fluent in French. Jackie Bouvier Kennedy completely... Uh, I don't want to say seduce the president of France because that might suggest uh, something other than when, than their you know just political relationship. But he was definitely very enamored with the first lady of the United States. A lot of people were, and uh, this kind of maybe helped ease the tension between the USA and France. But this was Gaullism. France has got a quite unique role in the Cold War era. Charles de Gaulle sees France as being kind of the forward-leading forward leading nation to ease Cold War tensions. We probably know who he had on his mind, thinking about France could be the greatest country in the world just in a different way in the post-war era. And Charles de Gaulle leads France in this glorious time until he bumps up against something that he will finally take him down. There's something that he, he just simply can't deal with. And what can't de Gaulle deal with? He can't deal with students at the University of Paris. Something very interesting happened in Paris in the May of 1968. This will be, as of present, the last time we will have a Paris commune. The people of Paris, and this time it's the students at the University of Paris, will throw up the barricades and try to take over the city. So let's talk about 1968, May, and what happened. It's kind of bizarre, but let's talk about the culture of 1968. The Vietnam War is on. Um, there have been riots in, uh, in, in, in 68. There's riots in Prague. Uh, that also happened in, in spring of 68. In the summer of 1968, the United States of America uh, has many riots. The, the biggest one happening in Chicago during the, during the Democratic National Convention there. Um, it's a time of student protest in the United States of America and all around the world. They're protesting the Vietnam War. They're, pro they're, they're, they're protesting the Cold War and the nuclear arms race. There's a lot of students... Uh, who are young and idealistic and don't have you know, full-time jobs or careers yet, who are actively protesting. And they took over Paris. How does this happen? How does this happen? It's, it's a bizarre thing. And, and to be honest, students, I sometimes have trouble explaining exactly what all went down. It was very complicated. But here are the basics of it. The University of Paris was not a progressive institution. To get a job as a professor at the University of Paris, you essentially had to be a good student, you had to get your PhD, and then you were appointed by professors, and then you could teach whatever you want. If you're a professor today at Ohio State University, you kind of live under a publisher parish, parish system. You have to constantly be doing research, constantly writing, and this might not make you a great teacher, but it certainly keeps you kind of at the, at, at, at the top of your game in terms of your knowledge and in, in, in your area of expertise. But they had these old fuddy-duddy professors at the University of Paris, and especially in their humanities classes, they were teaching very old-fashioned stuff, and the students kind of felt that these old professors were behind the times, so they started protesting some of the professors. Uh, when when one particular university student then was expelled for some of his radical statements and his I don't know whatever he was organizing, well, this kind of got some students upset and they start you know protesting even more, and so Charles de Gaulle has to deal with the fact that there's students hitting the streets and protesting at the University of Paris. So Charles de Gaulle, you know, tough old guy, World War One, World War Two vet that he is, says, well, send in the cops. So here come the cops, and the cops then begin, you know, trying to disperse the students. But this only antagonizes the students more, and the students really start, you know, turning over cars, setting things on fire, you know, locking themselves in buildings, barricading buildings, and this is kind of the beginning of the creation of the next Paris Commune. It starts in various buildings at the University of Paris, but then it spreads to the left bank of Paris, so it gets into the city. 
and the students are taking over the city. And they're able to start successfully doing this because at the time, workers, not students, but workers in Paris saw the students rising up in revolt and a lot of workers in Paris wanted better pay so they went on a general strike, and that's when things got big in Paris in the spring of 68. You had essentially blue-collar workers, you know, mostly men who would who were the furthest thing from university life. They joined up with the students and they began protesting for better wages at the same time that those students are protesting for. Well, what are the students protesting for? This is kind of what's weird. They originally just wanted to have a cultural change at the University of Paris. But then when when, when de Gaulle came in all heavy-handed, like the students, they just continued to, to rise up and more of them more got angry. And then, then they got radical. They start turning over cars, setting them on fire. And now they're taking over the university as a whole. And this is, and so what do the, what do the kids want? And that's when it gets weird and it gets interesting. This is the rock and roll generation. This is the LSD generation. This is the marijuana generation. These kids take control of the University of Paris and God knows what happens at the University of Paris when the students are running the show. So they called it the revolution of the imagination. It seems like a lot of them were communist and they were interested in France becoming a communist country, uh, but some of them were just flat out anarchists. They just believed in freedom, you know, free love, free dope, free whatever. It was a little bit like what we had here in the United States at Woodstock, but man, Woodstock was just three days and it was a half a million uh, kids in, 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 in rural New York. Uh, and here these students are taking over Paris. So the revolution of the imagination. Let's look at some pictures. <laughs> Police officers trying to disperse crowds of students and workers. Students barricading the city around uh, the Latin Quarter and uh, the University of Paris, the Sorbonne. Students <laughs> throwing a lot of rocks. <laughs> Students flooding the streets, turning over the cars, barricades, barricades, barricades. Here's a student-created barricade taking the French Citroën cars and setting them on fire. I look at this lady and I think about how old she is and what she has probably seen in France throughout the course of her lifetime, two world wars and whatnot. And here are students who are taking over her home city. We always have had Lady Liberty leading the people in French history. Now here's a college woman <laughs> waving some flag. I do not know what flag that is. It might be the North Vietnamese communist flag that she's waving. Sort of looks like that. It might be that. They definitely supported the North Vietnamese communists. Infiltrating the students, supporting them, encouraging them to become communist are these two old fogies, Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir. These two people are inspiring the, uh, the, the students. But you know, Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, they weren't really the big philosopher who was inspiring the students. The main philosopher, the French philosopher, who's actually actually German, who was really inspiring the, the, French, uh, the, the French kids, was this guy, a man by the name of Herbert Marcuse, who was uh, German uh, until the Nazis came to power, and then he fled to the United States of America, where he wrote a book called One Dimensional Man. One Dimensional Man was probably the most popular book among the students. In this book, Herbert Marcuse writes about how capitalism and modern science has destroyed human potential. We've lost our humanity and we've lost our artistic sensibilities. And this book really inspired the students that we wanted to bring back a multi-dimensional human being and we should no longer be the one-dimensional man that Herbert Marcuse has written about how we've all turned into. So the students, the one thing they were good at was graffiti and they spray painted graffiti all over the city 
Uh, one popular slogan was Marx Mao Marcuse, the three M's. And, uh, you know, we've got Marx, the founder of communism, Mao, the communist leader of China, and Marcuse, the writer. And uh, this kind of became what Paris looked like. Everywhere we see all of these, uh, all, all this graffiti. So this one's pretty flat out and direct. Anarchy. Here we have, uh, looks like uh, graffiti over on a bridge over the River Seine in downtown Paris. And uh, the graffiti, some of it got kind of quite clever and creative. Soyez realist and demande l'impossible. Be a realist and demand the impossible. Take your desires for realities. It is forbidden to forbid. <laughs> so, the, and, and, and this, as, as the French wax nostalgic about the May 68 riots, uh, they do remember the graffiti and the slogans that the students had spray painted all over Paris during their takeover of Paris. So, how does all this conclude? Well, de Gaulle can't handle it. So there's President Charles de Gaulle, and then there's sort of the second in command, the Prime Minister. So Charles de Gaulle, and here's the Prime Minister, Georges Pompidou, Charles de Gaulle can't handle the situation. He simply goes away to West Germany on for political business, doing something in West Germany. And leaves Pompidou in charge. Hey, what a nice thing. Pompidou, you're in charge. You handle the situation. So in May of 1968, Georges Pompidou puts an end to the student riots of Paris. How does he do it? Does he do it heavy-handedly? Does he send in the police or the French military or something like that? No. He does it with two very simple, swift actions as the, as, as the Prime Minister of the Fifth Republic. The first thing he does is he increases wages. So this ends the general strike. He simply says there's a new minimum wage. This is it. He pushes it through the National Assembly. The workers quit their strike. It's all over. Then, concerning the student riots in Paris, he says, I'm not going to do anything until June. What happens? The school year ends and students leave and go home, thus liberating the University of Paris. So what is student protest? What were they really protesting? Like the school year ended after they'd taken over the school and then they go home. So the whole student riot just fizzles out. It turns into nothing. Now, there were changes that were made into the educational system at the University of Paris. But that was it. The revolution of the imagination and the last time so far in French history that we've had a Paris commune. Charles de Gaulle retires in 1969, an elderly man to die a few years later, leaving in charge the new president of the Fifth Republic, President Georges Pompidou, who was the leader of France throughout the 1970s. But the May riots of 1968 did produce a lasting cultural change in France and in French politics. One of the opponents of Charles de Gaulle and one of the individuals in uh, the French government who supported the students was a young man at the time named Francois Mitterrand. Sw Francois Mitterrand was elected president of France in 1981. He is the president of France into the middle of the 1990s and he was a socialist. So France became a socialist state uh, throughout the 1980s and into the early 1990s, and then they'd have some conservative leadership up until the year uh, 2011, in which they elected their next socialist president, uh, Francois Hollande, uh, who is now no longer their president. But this socialist movement in France really kind of was uh, got some support thanks to the May 68 riots. It did have a lasting effect. It also had a lasting effect on uh, French culture as, as beyond politics. Uh, a lot of punk rock music, which developed in the 1970s, was uh, directly inspired by the May riots of 1968. So this is where I conclude with the story of France and the post-war era. More to come.